Do you believe as an atheist that life came from non-life? Um, probably. Yes. So if you can believe as an atheist that actual life can come from non-life, why is it a stretch to believe that someone that is dead comes back alive? Because your position is that numbers exist platonically and human beings are using that platonic language to describe nature. Am I being fair? That's I'm not being unfair. That's right. So that means then it's someone else's language. You've now got enough grounds to believe in God, evidential grounds. Because if mathematics is a language of description, which we both say it is, and if it is independent of human minds, which we both say it is, then it must be the product of another mind. And that other mind we call God. The first question I have yeah. is why would I... My understanding is that to become a Christian, you yep. require some amount of faith. Yep. And from my perspective as uh, an atheist or someone who's non-religious, yep. it seems like multiple people, multiple religious people, yep. you have contradictory conclusions. Yes. Both use faith to get to those conclusions. Yep. So why would I ever use faith? How could I? Okay. So faith, you, I think you, you kind of misunderstand faith. Faith is not epistemology or rather faith is a kind of epistemology or rather no let me rephrase that faith is an action based upon what you know but it's not epistemology and you're describing faith as epistemology it's absolutely true lots of different religions teach lots of different things they can't all be right and this is why the idea of relativism is a bad idea which atheism leads to relativism there's a straight line between atheism and relativism. And an ideology that is self-contradictory can't be true. So therefore, something has to be true, and it's about what is true. Faith is about what we do with the knowledge that we have. It's more akin to you describing, um, it's more akin to you getting married, really. Do you hope to get married? Right, will you base that marriage on insufficient, incomplete information. Are you sure? Do you know what will happen in 20 years time in your marriage? I don't. No. So, so, look, yeah, so what you're going to do is you're going to base your decision on what you know. Right? And you're going to say, I feel I know enough to build a now long-term relationship. But you journey forward in faith. You're assuming that this person you're going to marry 20 years is still going to be a person you want to be married to. And that's what faith is. Yeah, of course. You said, you said, um, you used the word insufficient. I disagree that if I marry someone, I have insufficient evidence. No, so, so maybe, let me, let me take that term back because I don't want to get caught up on it. I'm happy to say uh, sufficient in terms of making a decision. But it isn't knowing the future. Yes. You traverse the future by faith in a marriage. Because you assume that this person's not going to cheat on you. You assume that she's not going to rob you. You assume that she, you know, she's going to be all the things that she said she's going to be. Do you get what I'm saying? I do. The issue with that is I believe that I would have some sort of... I believe I will have information yes. just by looking at previous behavior. Yes. That is, that's information. It's not really an assumption. And we Christians have the same. Um, we have the same because we see God's relation to Israel. We see the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the, the fulfillment of prophecies of the church. Like, and we see those promises that God gave thousands of years ago becoming true in, in both Jesus Christ and in the church's life. So we have um, the testimony of history, just like you're claiming. So we have what you're talking about. Okay, so another, with the, we'll keep on going with the marriage uh, analogy. Yeah. I believe it's entirely possible that after I get married, that I'm wrong. Yes. Based on the information that I have. Yes. That, you don't, with, a, with religion, you don't have that, you have certainty. Right, so, so it, then the question is not about whether we're operating by faith, because we both agree that we are. The question is, are we putting our faith in someone that is faithful? Now, you might get that wrong with a woman or a man, but putting your faith in the God of Israel, in Yahweh, 
in the God revealed through Jesus Christ, you're putting your faith in someone who will never fail to keep his promises. You will never fail to accomplish his work. And so that your argument actually is about who we're putting faith in. And I'm saying that God has testified through his actions with Israel and testified through his actions with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and testified through the course of the church's history through time that he is faithful to accomplish his promises. So I guess in summary you're saying the reason that you can trust that it's okay to have faith in the Christian yes. is because of prophecies that have been... That is one of the things I'm saying, yes. Uh, the other question, I, I asked you before about hell, and you said it's an unpleasant, unpleasant. Place. Yeah. I would agree with you. And personally, if there is a God, I would like to be in heaven with God. Yes, think. yes. Why did God make, make him, if he knows, obviously, because God is finished, why would God make him knowing that I'm going to go to an unpleasant place? Well, I don't yeah. want to be. Well, well, don't talk yourself into a corner. You can become a Christian today, and then you will be saved. So don't, don't back yourself out of something, right? God creates you because he loves you, and he wants you to know and love him and freely choose him, right? So he knows that in the, the, the creation of a free... What's your name, sorry? Javon. In, a free, in the creation of a free Javon, there is an opportunity for you to reject him. But he has to allow you to do that because if he didn't allow you to do that, you wouldn't be free. That's part of the reason why for God's hiddenness. If God just made himself demonstrably present to everyone, you wouldn't have a free choice. So you couldn't, you couldn't, freely, you couldn't freely enter into a loving relationship because for us as Christians, we believe that God wants you to love him and enjoy him. But love requires freedom. And freedom means that you can't be compelled to, to, to believe in him and, and to follow him. And if God is true and, 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 ex and forces his existence on everybody, then that freedom is taken away. You've just got to believe and you will just follow him because you've got no choice because you know he exists. The only way you can reject him is because there's a possibility he might not exist. He has to create that possibility um, epistemologically to allow you to have freedom so that you can freely, lovingly choose to enter in relationship with him. But if you do make that free choice to reject him, there are consequences. And this is why hell exists. Uh, this one. Yep. You said that if I do go to hell, it would be something that I've chosen. Yes. I think that's false. Go on. Because I, want, I would love to be a Christian yeah. and have a heaven I can go to. I, I literally became an atheist because I was trying to strengthen my Christianity. Yeah. So I'm trying to, when I'm trying to be a Christian and it doesn't work, how can you really say that I'm freely choosing right. to go to hell? And even if you don't know, think of me for example, we, we can both probably agree that there are people who legitimately didn't know uh, the gospel. Yeah. yeah. So with regards to people that didn't know, those people will be judged by whatever truth they know. They're not going to be judged by whether they know the gospel. They're going to be judged by whatever truth is available to them that they accept or reject. Can I ask where it says that in the Bible? So it says in Psalms that the heaven and the earth declare the glory, the, the handiwork of the Lord. And that night and day they pour forth speech. And that there is no language in which they are not heard. There's no tongue in which they are not heard. They're obviously all mankind, it says in the Bible that all mankind is going to be judged. Right? The, the question is, we both can think logically and understand that if someone's never heard the gospel, they can't be judged on the gospel, can they? I, I agree. Because it, say it says in the Bible that God is supremely just and fair. It says that you know how to give your children good things. Do you not think your Father in heaven knows how to give you good things if you ask him? So the point is, if people search for the truth, God will give them the truth. But if the truth... I, that, they're, that they have access to is not the gospel, they're not going to be judged on the gospel. It's just logical. From the premises, the conclusion follows. I, I don't agree. I okay. think you're, it sounds like you're assuming that it must be the case that God would judge them by what they know. Why would he not? That's, because that's logical. I, when I hear what you said, it sounds to me like, oh, obviously God's going to judge them because of by what they know. It sounds to me like a flaw in the, in the consistency of the Bible. Well, I think, I think the problem is that you're approaching the Bible um, in, a, in a very unerudite 
um, and naive way. Can you define an erudite? An erudite means that you, like, like in, in terms of in terms of how we explain the Bible, because I would say to, I would suggest to you, bro, that that what you're doing is that you are you're looking you you see you you're assuming that the Bible has to have proof texts for everything Christians believe, and it doesn't. Christians don't believe that we don't practice that. I'm not inviting you to accept a religion that does. But that is how you're approaching this conversation. You're saying that the Bible should have a proof text to every statement I make. That's not how Christians use the Bible. I'm not inviting you to that religion. So it's kind of like a it's kind of like a straw man argument. The Bible tells us, describes God, and it describes what God will do. It says that God will judge the world. It says that God is just and that God is righteous. Well, a righteous judge doesn't judge you by what you don't know. It's just a lot, the, 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 the conclusions flow from the premises. If God is judge, and if God is a just judge, well, a just judge judges you by what you do know, not by what you don't know. Okay, um, one more question. Yeah. It's kind of, it's related to the resurrection. Yeah. So I guess we would both agree that the resurrection is probably what the what the truth of Christianity rests upon. Absolutely. Yeah. That is the biblical position. Yeah. The issue with me is again starting from the position of an atheist. Yep. Someone who has seen no evidence of anything supernatural. Yeah. Why would I ever just actually did raise come back from the dead just because people say that? Right. From the perspective of someone who's, who has no evidence of anything supernatural, yeah. it seems infinitely more likely that there will be some sort of naturalistic explanation. Okay. Yeah. Right. So when when we come to address historical questions, we need to think like historians. And when we look, what is not disputed amongst historians is that the 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 Christian Church is born because of the resurrection. Something happened to the, the first Christians that convinced them that a man that they knew who had died um, was risen from the dead, right? And we have lots of evidence to show that this is what happened, that this is their experience. For instance, like they start venerating a Sunday as if it's an important day. Well, there's no Jewish reason to do that, so why are they doing it? There's also lots of Jewish ways you respond when your teacher dies. You venerate his tomb. You go to his tomb, you decorate it, you go to his tomb, you listen to his teachings, you go to his tomb on, on, the, on an anniversary and you pray to God at his tomb, right? Christians didn't do that. You, the Christians started doing things like including Gentiles into their religion. They started talking about Jesus having risen from the dead. Now, there's gotta be something that sparks that off. And the question would be, what would convince you that a man you knew had died, had risen from the dead. What would convince you personally? Uh, I have no idea. Right, well you maybe, think on that. Maybe, I guess the example you're going for is seeing him. Well, I'm asking you, well, you're giving me guess, your answer. Okay, if he came back yep. and told me something that only he would know, that I know that only he would know. So only that would convince you that a man who you knew had died had risen from the dead? No, that's just one example. No, I'm, so I'm asking you, what would convince you that a man you knew had died had risen from the dead? If I saw him and he... And... You got it. No. There, there you go. There's more. If I saw just, him. You can't just see someone. For, for example, hypothetically, this doesn't apply in the, the case for, for Jesus. Yeah. But if I... It's possible there's a twin. So there's a whole film based on his premise. Yep. Yeah, someone dies. Are you talking about... Are you, are you talking about um, Monty Python's... No, um, life of Brian. No. Right. Okay. Right. So, so the the, the thing is that that's a, a suggestion made by Bart Ehrman, right? But even people like Bart Ehrman say, and he's not a friend of Christians. Even people like Bart Ehrman say that um, something happened to make people believe that their Messiah, who they knew had died, had risen from the dead. And and throwing out the idea that there is a twin is that. But the thing is, if that is true. We've got to ask the question, why wasn't that twin known before? Why didn't people know that twin before? And why does the twin go around convincing people that he is the risen Jesus? And why 
do people then go and find an empty tomb? Because if Jesus died on a cross and then a twin went round trying to trick everybody that he was the risen Jesus, you've still got a body in a tomb, but the body is empty. So the theory doesn't explain all the evidence. And we know that the tomb was empty. Firstly, in my defense, I did tell you this twin example doesn't actually count in the case Right, so let's deal with the Jesus question okay. because that's what we're here to deal about. Okay. Because would you agree with me, if Jesus rose from the dead, you need to become a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, there we go. So let's not talk about anything else except the actual event of Jesus' resurrection. Okay, here's a, here's a more plausible hypothesis. Go on. Let's say, this is very, there's no evidence for this. This is just Agreed. internally consistent. Yeah, so, go on. Okay, um, Jesus, the idea of Jesus, I would say, is a, is, he's a good person to yep. follow. Yeah. Uh, all of the, the turn the other stuff. Yep. Uh, great guy. Let's say, hypothetically, the disciples at the time decided, okay, even though Jesus may not be the Messiah, it would be, there would be utility. I'm not utility, sorry. But it would be good if people followed this idea of Jesus. Yep. So after Jesus died, they convinced the Roman, they convinced the Romans yep. that this would be good for humanity. The Romans removed the body of Jesus from the tomb. Um, and then all of them pretend Okay. So, so let me let me let me address that because I can tell, bro, that that you don't know any history. True. So, what actually happened was Jesus rose from the dead, and the apostles went to the Jews, and they went and preached a risen Jesus, and the Jews initially resisted the Christian teaching, and then used the Romans to persecute the Christians, and then the Romans, for their own reasons, started persecuting the Christians. So your hypothesis collapses immediately because your hypothesis is that people say, convince the Romans that Jesus is a good idea. And then the Romans start teaching that everyone that Jesus has risen. That's not what happened in history. What happened in history was that Christians, and we see this in the book of Acts, which is a, a first century document talking about the first century church, describing what happens. And the, 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 the initial event was that the, the apostles go out to the Jewish people and preach the risen Jesus. And then they go out to the Gentiles and preach the risen Jesus. That in itself still has to be explained why they're doing that, but neither groups wholeheartedly accepted it. Jews resisted it and the Romans resisted it for different reasons. The Romans resisted it because it caused problem with the Jews and they didn't like problems with the Jews. And the Jews resisted it because they didn't like the idea that their Messiah should suffer and die. And so they resisted it. And so the, Jew, the, the, the early Jewish Gentile church was persecuted for this preaching. So your hypothesis collapses against the evidence. And this question of the early church being persecuted is irrefutable and it is non-controversial and it is uh, not something that you can argue against. And most importantly, you said yourself, there's no evidence for this. Yes. As someone who believes in a, a, a strong epistemology, surely you agree that we should base our conclusions on the evidence. True. Right. So what is the evidence? The evidence, the evidence is I have no, have no reason to believe that anything supernatural is possible. Right. That is not evidence. That's a presupposition. Okay. What is the evidence? The evidence is that 2,000 years ago, a group of people who had no cultural, ideological, or spiritual reason to do so, out of the blue, started teaching that their Messiah, that everybody knew had died, had risen from the dead. And then they went out and they started preaching that, and then they died for that statement. They founded communities based upon that teaching, on that reality. And then they wrote books to that community and letters to that community that we call the New Testament. What is undeniable is that something happened to make them think it. So therefore the question is, what? Now you've given hypotheses. Let me give you one. Jesus actually rose from the dead. Now my hypothesis actually deals with the evidence. It accounts for the empty tomb because the body rose from the dead. It accounts for the fact that a bunch of people started saying that Jesus had risen from the dead 
when they knew he died because he'd actually risen from the dead. It accounts for the fact that they start venerating Sunday as a special day when they got no reason not to because Jesus rose on a Sunday. It accounts for the fact that this religion started in Jerusalem because that's where Jesus rose rather than say Alexandria or Rome or Carthage. If it was just a mystical belief, it could have started anywhere, but it didn't, it started in Jerusalem. It accounts for the fact that Paul, having persecuted the church, comes to believe in a risen Jesus. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. It accounts for the fact that Christians start honouring the cross as some kind of sacred symbol because it's connected to the resurrection. It accounts for all of these things, but none of the hi other hypotheses do. And these are facts that are pre-biblical. These are facts pre-biblical. The Bible writes about them, but it writes about them because the Christians were doing them before the New Testament was written. So it's not based on, oh, well, the Bible tells me so. No, the Bible tells me so because these people were doing it. Do you get? So you've got to under, we've, we've, got to, we've got to deal with that reality. And when you really do do the homework and you really do do the deep thinking, the only sound conclusion is that Jesus rose from the dead, which is fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Because that's what the Bible prophesies, which itself is miraculous. And this happened all before the New Testament was written. Yeah, I, I still feel like I haven't got a, a good answer to the question. Great. You've said, you've said that. I have. Um, <laughs> what question? So, because you're saying you don't have a good answer, so because it's my question, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying what made people believe that Jesus had risen from the my dead? Actual position is that, I which I'd like to know. It. That's why I said at the start. Yeah. And then you asked me for some examples. I right. just gave some. Great. Off the top of my head. Fair but enough. The, quest, the initial question is, as an atheist, yeah. as someone who's never seen any evidence of anything supernatural. Yeah. Whenever I've heard of anything that is purported to be supernatural, there has actually been a naturalistic explanation. Why would I ever assume? that something supernatural did happen rather than just something yeah. natural that hasn't been figured out. Can I ask you this question? Mm -hmm. Do you believe as an atheist that life came from non-life? Um, probably, yeah. Yes. So if you can believe as an atheist that actual life can come from non-life, why is it a stretch to believe that someone that is dead comes back alive? Do people come back alive when they die? Yeah, so isn't it actually closer to experiential reality, the idea that a dead person becomes a living person, isn't that closer to experienced reality than the claim that non-life becomes life? Have you ever observed non-life becoming life? No. Has anyone? No, not to mind. Has anyone evidenced it? Arguably. No. I would say arguably. No, they haven't. Give me what, what's the evidence? Here's the argument that you give, no, no, they give okay. an argument. Okay, okay. They give okay. a presupposition. Okay. They give a theory, okay. but no one has demonstrated that you can jump from chemicals to life. Okay. No one has done that. So my question to you is, why do you believe in something to which there is no evidence? I'll retry my statement. I'm not, I'm not entirely married to the idea. Okay, yeah. so my point is, within the atheist worldview is a whole bunch of assumptions that aren't actually justified by any evidence. So, for example, as an atheist, what you should be committed to is the idea that we live in a cold, heartless, indifferent universe in which your life has absolutely no meaning and no purpose. I think that's false. As an atheist, how you get to meaning and purpose from the belief that there is no God. You can get, what I believe is you can have subjective meaning. Agreed. I would say meaning is to or from a perspective. Great. So that's what you can have as a belief. Right. So you can get, how do you get to the idea of truth? Truth. Um, what is I, truth? No, I can't. Exactly. Right. So if there is no truth. Actually, no, I wait, can't. Okay, go on. Okay. I would say truth is that which aligns with reality. That's Truth is that which aligns with the reality, but is all reality, but is there metaphysical non-material non realities? I have no idea. Of course there is. Truth is an example of a... meaning is an example. These are non-physical, uh, real realities by which our life is organised and governed. Agreed? 
Yes. The right. reason I can I Yeah, go on. The reason I said I have no idea is because you said metaphysical. I do believe in non non physical realities. Right. Yep. Uh, such as truth. What about the mind? Numbers. The, I I lean towards the idea that the mind is just a emergent property from the structure. I agree. The mind is an emergent property of the brain. Right. But then it is the mind that allows us to, under, to, to access ideas like meaning, agreed? Mm -hmm. So we could say that the idea of meaning is an emergent property of mind, is that agreed? So we have one non-material reality giving rise to another non-material reality. Could use a different example. But, 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 but your definition of truth is that truth is that which corresponds to reality. So truth exists outside of the mind, does it not? Truth. Yes, yes. Right. You've just said that truth exists outside of the mind. Right? Which means that you've just accepted that there's non-material realities that are independent of mind. Yeah. yeah. Right. If there are non... If, like mathematics. Yeah. Right. Mathematics is a language, isn't it? Yeah. We're dis a language? What do you mean by language? Well, it's a means of communication and it's a means of description. Sure. Right. It's dependent on mind, isn't it? You need a mind to do maths. You do need a mind to do maths. I think, I think math can exist without a mind. I, I, I agree it can exist without our mind. And that's the point, is we are discovering mathematical structures in the universe all the time. But mind is a language. Mind is a language. Mind is a language. It's a form of description. I can use mathematics to describe a sphere to you and if you're training mathematics, you can go, hey, he's describing a sphere. And you can describe the hypotenuse of a triangle to me. And if I know mathematics, I can go, hey, he's describing the hypotenuse of a triangle. And we can use mathematics to describe the speed of light and, it's re and, and how uh, we convert mass into energy. And we can use mathematics to describe all kinds of different things to a degree that is beyond our natural human ability like pi, for instance, an infinite number, that we use computers to dig into pi to the nth degree, which means that it is a reality that exists independent of our human minds, but it does exist in reality, it exists in the universe, and we're discovering it, which means that it is a language of someone else's mind. And that is an I evidence for God. Right, so let's do this step, step by step. Do you believe that languages are the product of minds? Yes. Do you believe that mathematics is a language? Um, not necessarily, and not in the way that I was talking about when I said yesterday. Okay, so what, in, in what way do you think, is, well, in what way do you think mathematics is a language? It is a language in that it can describe, so it's like a way of, so, yeah, it's descriptive. It's descriptive, thank you. Yeah, it's descriptive. Thank you very much. Yeah. What do you say? All right, bro, let me give you... God bless you, bro. Thanks, appreciate yeah. Right? So we've, we've established so far that it, maths is a, a language of description. That it is descriptive. That it is descriptive. Yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's a language of description. And you agreed earlier that languages are products of mind. Can I define languages? When... Yeah, go on. Define your say, define term language. I would say a language is a, a means of communication developed by humans to communicate information with each other. Agreed. And is mathematics a language used by humans to communicate concepts and realities in the world? It is, but I didn't say used by, I said developed. Great. So, so are I, you saying that mathematics is developed by us? Uh, no. I right. Think I, I lean towards something, I think it's called Platonism, but I think that mathematics can physically... Yeah. So, so, so my point is to you, bro, is that if you are accepting, there's actually a Platonist who became a Christian in this park for exactly the reasons that we're just talking about. He was like you. He believed numbers existed independent of mind. They existed in a platonic sense, which is, sounds like your position. Yeah. But the point is, bro, you've now, you've now got enough grounds to believe in God, evidential grounds. Because if mathematics is a language of description, which we both say it is, and if it is independent of human minds, which we both say it is, then it must be the product of another mind. And that other mind we call God. And so therefore, we have good groundings to believe in God. Because in the Bible it says that the heavens and the earth pour forth speech. 
night and day they speak that there isn't a, 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 a nation or a people that do not hear them. Well, what's he talking about? It's talking about the heavens and he's talking about the earth. It's talking about the material world. And when we study the universe, we study it and use maths. The Greeks were doing it long before Christianity. That's how they got the circumference of the earth. That's how they got the idea that the earth was being revolved around by the moon, right? They use mathematics to do all of that, right? So in other words, they were engaging in a dialogue with nature, a dialogue that the Bible testifies is there that is speaking of our creator. And for this reason, you have good grounds to believe in God's existence. Can we go back a little bit? Yes. So earlier, I, I said that the spoken language, that version of language, I use the term, I use the word, it's developed by humans. Yes. As in, it's nece it necessarily comes from humans. But the logic of your position is that humans are using another language. Because your position is that numbers exist platonically, mm -hmm. and human beings are using that platonic language to describe nature. Am I being fair? That's fair. I'm not being unfair. That's complete. Right. So that means then it's someone else's language. I do, it doesn't have to be someone else's language because I gave you two different versions of language. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I fundamentally think that your definition of language that wants to caveat mathematics off to being something separate and different is a flawed definition. It's a definition by convenience. You're making a, a definition of language mathematically to suit your desire not to believe in God. Could you give me your definition? My so definition of language is that language is a means of communication between minds. Now, it doesn't require that those minds be human. But it does require that minds are involved and it is, it is origin in mind. Languages emerge from mind. But I'm not committed to the idea that only human minds exist. So I believe that mathematics, which is clearly a descriptive language, is the product of another mind, the mind of God. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that. Argument. Fair enough. That. Right, brother, I want to I wanna give you a gift. Bear with us. Have you got a Bible, bro? I do. You do? Right, hold on then. Bear with me. No, not that one. Ugh. Yes. That's how that's how it's supposed to be. I've had a lot of discussions with Christians and Muslims. Right. And most of them don't have as good responses as you. So that's why I came. Thanks. Well, I want to give you the Richard Dawkins fictional world. Have a read of that because it it, it deals with the problems of an atheistic worldview, right? And my encouragement to you is get your Bible, read it. And then just come back to me with your questions and we'll talk some more. Yeah? Yeah. All right. See you. Look after yourself.